Hi, everybody out there. Welcome. Poets, can I get a thumbs up if you can hear me? Beautiful. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. I am Emily Grice. I'm Digital Content Manager at Copper Canyon Press, and I'm coming to you live right now from St. Louis, which is where I usually live and work and where I'm now sheltering in place, uh, like so many of us, specifically from here in my cozy home office. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're getting ready for a live book launch reading with Tracy Brimhall, Layla Shetty, and John Freeman. And they're going to read from their gorgeous new books, which I'm going to hold up for you now. Um, here is Tracy's. This is Come the Slumberless to the Land of Nod. This is Layla's. This is Deluge. And this is John's. This is The Park. Um, this is our second of four launch party live streams that we're hosting in the month of April for National Poetry Month. Uh, we're relatively new to Zoom, as so many are right now, so thank you so much for joining us for this experiment. Um, if those of you who are watching out there right now have questions or comments for the poets, you can look for the Q&A feature that's, I think, toward the bottom of your Zoom window, and you can enter a question and or a comment, and we'll get to those at the end if we have time. Um, if it would help you to see closed captioning, we'll be attempting to live closed caption this reading in real time. You'll just need to enable the closed captioning feature that's also at the bottom of your screen. And if you're joining us uh, from the simultaneous live stream on our Facebook page, thank you so much. Uh, welcome. Comments or questions on the Facebook stream won't get to us directly here in Zoom, but we'll be doing our best to keep an eye on Facebook at the same time. So um, a little bit of background information before we get started. As you probably know, Copper Canyon Press is a nonprofit independent book publisher that's been publishing poetry exclusively for almost 50 years. Uh, you're tuned into our series of launch party live stream readings, which are a way for us to stay connected with all of you in this era of social distancing and to launch uh, all of these beautiful new books. Um, because we weren't able to attend AWP, our authors have had to cancel book tours and other events, and so many of the beloved bookstores that we all love um, have had to close their doors to the public. So speaking of bookstores, um, if you fall in love with any of these poets' work, which we hope you do, and you have the means, we encourage you to purchase or pre-order their books from an independent bookseller so you can support an indie bookseller during this crisis. Um, we love our West Coast friends and neighbors at Open Books, a poetry emporium, as well as the Elliott Bay Book Company. Both are still fulfilling online orders, uh, so we hope you'll check them out. Uh, folks who are in the Midwest with me, Tracy has recommended Dusty Bookshelf, which is in Manhattan, Kansas. They've confirmed that they do have her book in stock and are taking orders online and by phone. Another fantastic Midwest option recommended by Layla is Literati in Ann Arbor, Michigan. They would be thrilled to take your online order for Deluge at literatibookstore.com. And East Coast friends um, in John's neck of the woods, McNally Jackson in New York City is open for online orders at mcnallyjackson.com and they would love to sell you John's book. So uh, while we're sharing the love, we wanna say that we are so grateful for support from our donors, from our board of directors, uh, and funders like the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, For Culture, and the National Endowment for the Arts, who are providing crucial relief funding for arts organizations like ours so that we can keep the poetry coming. So thank you. Um, Welcome everybody who's just joining us. We are going to present four of these live stream readings in total. This is number two. So you can check out coppercanyonpress.org or find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram where you'll find all the details for the rest of the series, one each week in April. So um, let's go ahead and kick things off. Um, it is my immense pleasure to introduce you to our first reader, who's Tracy Brimmel. Today we are celebrating Tracy's new book, Come the Slumberless to the Land of Nod, uh, the cover of which is Tracy's amazing background, which you're going to see in a second. Um, Come the Slumberless to the Land of Nod weaves poetry and lyric essay in a gorgeous blend of genres. She's also the author of the collections Sodage, also from Copper Canyon Press, and Our Lady of the Ruins and Rookery. And Tracy is coming to us live from Manhattan, Kansas. So I'll hand things over to Tracy. Hello, it's uh, great to get to share um, this virtual space with Layla and John. Um, and I, yeah, coming to you from the Little Apple, people say like, oh, you came from Manhattan. I was like, yes. 
<laughs> um, this lovely little town of 50,000. Um, so I'm going to start. Um, I'm only doing four poems today. I'm starting with um, Love Poem Without a Drop of Hyperbole. Um, and part of the generation of the poem came from this really great, great quote by Oscar Wilde, um, where he said, without exaggeration, there can be no love. And I'm here to say, like, love is not exaggerated. All of this is real. So love poem without a drop of hyperbole. I love you like ladybugs love windowsills. Love you like sperm whales love squid. There's no depth I wouldn't follow you through. I love you like the pawns and chess love aristocratic horses. I'll throw myself in front of a bishop or a queen for you, even a sentient castle. My love is crazy like that. I like that sweet little hothouse mouth you have. I like to kiss you with tongue, with gusto, with socks still on. I love you like a vulture loves the careless deer at the roadside. I wanna get all up in you. I love you like Isis loved Osiris, but her devotion came up a few inches short. I'll train my breath and learn to read sonar until I retrieve every lost blood vessel of you. I swear this love is ungodly, not an ounce of suffering in it. Like salmon with its upstream itch, I'll dodge grizzlies for you. Like hawks to skyscraper rooftops, I'll keep coming back, maddened, a little hopeless, embarrassingly in love. And that's why I'm on the couch, kissing pictures on my phone instead of calling you in from the kitchen, where you are undoubtedly making dinner too spicy. But when you hold the spoon to my lips and ask if it's ready, I'll say it is, always, but never, there is never enough. This next poem uh, is called Oh Wonder. Um, and uh, I just wanna give a shout out to my writing group here in Manhattan, Kansas, who when I first turned it in trying to write a poem that was wholly and only positive, they said, but look at this line here and look at this line here. You're not being honest or you're turning away too soon. And it was because of them that I think the poem found what it wanted to be. So shout out to all the writing groups in the world who help keep us honest and say the real thing. Oh wonder. It's the garden spider who eats her mistakes at the end of day so she can billow in the lung of night, dangling from an insecure branch or caught on the coral spur of a dove's foot and sleep, her spinnerets trailing radials like ungathered hair. It's a million pound cumulus. It's the troposphere holding it, miraculous. It's a mammatus rolling her weight through dusk, waiting to unhook and shake free the hail. Sometimes it's so ordinary it escapes your notice. Hothos reaching for windows, ease of an avocado slipping its skin. A porcelain boy with lamp black eyes told me most mammals have the same average number of heartbeats in a lifetime. It's why the mouse's engine hums too hot to last. It is the blue whale's slow electricity. Six pumps per minute is the way to live centuries. I think it's also the hummingbird I saw in a video, lifted off a cement floor by firefighters and fed sugar water until she was, again, a tempest. It wasn't when my mother lay on the garage floor and my brother tried lifting her and I tried shouting louder than her sobs, but it was her heart, a washable ink. It was her dark's genius, how it moaned slow enough to outlive her. It is the orca who pushes her dead calf a thousand miles before she drops it or it falls apart. And it is also when she plays with her pod the day after. It is the night my son tugs at his pajama collar and cries, the sad is so big, I can't get it all out. And I behold him, astonished, his sadness as clean and abundant as spring, his thunder heart, a marvel I refuse to invade with empathy. And outside, Clouds grown like gods. A garden spider consumes her home. It's knowing she can weave it tomorrow between citrus leaves and earth. It's her chamberless heart cleaving the length of her body. It is lifting my son into my lap to witness the birth of his grieving. And shout out also from that poem um, to copy editors of the world who, uh, when look, going through this book, um, was like, so actually you said like, you know, this layer of the atmosphere, it, the cloud actually is in the troposphere. And I was like, oh my God, facts, are so rad. Um, and I'm so grateful for the time, attention and care that my book received at every stage from Copper Canyon. Um, and that poem just in particular, uh, 
I had a conversation back and forth about how many beats per minute does a blue whale's heart have of like, how are we being accurate or favoring sound? And it's just like the best conversation ever. Um, and I was so lucky to get to have that. Um, this next poem is called How to Sugar for the Atlas. Um, because the book interweaves things about, you know, having my son that was in the last poem. Um, and my mother died shortly after my son was born. Um, and my friend's murder trial was going on while I was pregnant. So the poem's constantly weaving back and forth between these life and death events. So how to sugar for the atlas. Um, it's the atlas moth. Um, and so some of the references um, to death um, are for my friend um, after his murder. How to sugar for the atlas. Begin first with the intent to lure a bright species, the luna with its lichen glow or the cloudless sulfur with its daffodil flutter. Ask the moon for the garnet symmetry of the atlas with its wing powder like ash or the wrong snow. Create the temptation, brown sugar, stale beer, molasses, blackened bananas. Ratios aren't important, but apply to bark with a paintbrush while singing murder ballads until your trees reek with sweetness. Coat them at dusk and wait for dark. Watch for souls returning with furred faces and nocturnal hungers approaching from Arctic latitudes. Yes, call his name when the first one arrives. Don't be surprised he doesn't recognize you. Watch him dip his proboscis with tender amnesia in the bait. Don't be surprised when you need to keep him, this creature with spiracles that claims not to know you. Bag and freeze him. Give him a gentle second death. Slow his panic to dull flaps. Help him relax enough for saving. This is another immortality, you can say, as you pin and label him with careful ink. This is the kind of cruel others will understand. You want him whole again, not like his first death, when police found him and thought he was moving, how he looked dressed for the night before flies rose from his body, holding the shape of him midair, a shadow with a thousand wings, and then a prayer. And uh, my last poem um, is called Contender. Um, and I think since uh, the Racehorse Secretariat was featured um, in an insurance commercial, I don't know if people, uh, are still unfamiliar with him, but Secretariat was a very famous racehorse that won the Triple Crown. Um, and uh, a special prize of the Triple Crown is that horses get to be buried whole, fun to know. Um, but that there was still uh, like a, um, a study of Secretariat after uh, he died and they realized part of Secretariat's success was this really large heart. Uh, and it's always been this like emotional goal of mine to have a really large heart. So this poem is Contender, and it's my last one. Um, and it's great to digitally be here with everyone that I can't see and don't know is there, but I believe, I believe in you, invisible audience. Contender. It's all right to overdress for the riot. Your rage is stunning. It's all right to pursue the wrong pleasures and the right suffering. Here's my permission, take it. It's all right to replace a siren with a bell. Your emergency should make its music. It's all right that the meter reader broke your sunflower in half. You knew better than to plant it where you did. Sometimes it's all right if you call your waiter honey when you order sweet tea. It's all right if you fall out of love with being alive, but rise again tomorrow with French pop songs and fresh croissants. Wear all your gold to church and try, really try, to believe anything but a stethoscope can hear your heart's urgency. It's all right that your mother died. So will your father and your son but hopefully not before you. It's all right to lie naked in the rain and refuse to go inside, even when the moon tries to make your cold thighs shine. It's okay to lick the ice cream cake from your fingers. Do it, now, in front of everyone. And if what falls on the children lining up their cars for the soapbox derby is not snow but ash, that's all right. Celebrate the mutable body. And if you write notes to friends and senators in primary colors, that's fine. It's even okay to begrudge the stubborn pears in the wooden bowl. You're right, you know. They're waiting to yellow until you turn away. It's all right that in the economy of forgiveness, you keep coming up one daffodil short. It's all right if you ask your heart to grow to the size of secretariats, not because you want to outrun other horses or because your legs are classic, but because you too want to be buried whole 
after someone examines the insensible engine you left behind. I am of the beloved's name, no longer metronoming the valves, and places that slick fist in a stainless tray for weighing and shouts, sweet Jesus, before describing its ungodly heft with superlatives. Your heart, the most tireless, wildest, wiliest, thirstiest heat on record. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tracy. That was lovely. Um, I, I grew up in Kentucky, which is like, you know, racehorse central, and they filmed some of the like racetrack scenes for the movie Secretariat, like in and around my hometown. And so everybody in my hometown's like cool anecdote is that they were an extra in the movie Secretariat, but like one out of every three people that you meet was an extra in Secretariat. And so that like lowers the value of that bragging right a little bit. Um, I, I love that. That was lovely. Thank you. I, I like too that you mentioned your writing group. Um, I keep thinking about all the groups of people, um, writing groups and reading groups and book clubs and writing workshops and all of the groups of people who come together over poetry and books and how so many of us um, are finding ways to stay connected and continue to gather around poetry and books even though we can't be in the same physical space and I, I love that we're kind of creating that space right now. So thank you so much, Tracy. Um, our next reader is Layla Shuddy. Uh, Layla's going to be reading from her stunning full-length debut collection, Deluge, today, and she's also the author of The Chat Books Ebb and Tensia Amerikia. Uh, Lay Layla lives in Cleveland, Ohio, where she's the inaugural Annisfield Wolf Fellow in writing and publishing at Cleveland State University. So I'll turn it over to you, Layla. Am I there? Hi. <laughs> um, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I'm so glad that we we're able to, to do this virtually. Um, and I'm so happy to be reading with John and Tracy. Um, this is my first book. And so I'm very uh, ec excited about all of this and to, to have this happening. Um, so thank you so much, Copper Canyon, Emily, Laura, um, everybody. Um, I don't usually chat a lot because I get a little nervous in between poems if I do that. So I'm going to read sort of straight through, I think. Um, but yeah, this is what it looks like. I'm going to start with the first poem, um, which is Confession. Um, and uh, the, the poem has an epigraph um, from the Quran and in, in the scene in which um, Mary's giving birth to, to Jesus. And she says, For I wish I had died before this and was in oblivion, forgotten. Confession. Truth be told, I like Mary a little better when I imagine her like this, crouched and cursing, a boy god pushing on her cervix. I like remembering she had a cervix, her body ordinary and so like mine. Girl sweat lacing rivulets like veins in the sand. Her small hands on her knees, not doves, but hands gripping, a palm pressed to her spine, fronds whispering with voyeurs overhead. Oh, Mary. Like a god, I too take pleasure in knowing you were not all holy, that ache could undo you like a knot. And suffering, I admire this girl who cared for a moment not about God or his plans, but her own distinct life. This fiercer Mary who disappear if it saved her, who'd howl to hell with salvation if it meant this pain. The blessed adolescent who squatted indignant in a desert, bearing his child like a secret she never wanted to hear. Mary speaks. And what could I say when he entered? Rude as a dream, bare flame of a man with wings and demands, not his own. I'd been raised a good girl to house my tongue in my mouth, to be hospitable towards strangers, suspicious of no one. Perhaps I'd have been better off to be wary, but I'd been waiting so long to hear God speak, I hadn't thought to think of what he might tell me. Sarcoma. When the doctor says the word sarcoma, I consider how it might be a nice name for a daughter, that good feminine A, the way parents name their children for all sorts of inappropriate things. Apples, for instance, or the place where the baby was conceived. 
and I trace my fingers over the barrel of my belly as he speaks, flesh distended beneath the blue tissue I wear for a dress, an ideal grief rock, throw away. And he says something about life expectancy, but of course I expect my life, so plain I thought nothing would ever take it. And while he explains, I cut my palms around my center, as if comforting a child or covering her ears. Litany while reading scripture and the gynecologic oncology waiting room. And God said, let there be blood. And God said, flood. And God said, good as a woman with fruit in her womb and not in her hand. And God said, sin. And God did not say, forgive. And God said, I will make a stormy wind. And God said, sun, a breath stirring. And God said, highly favored. And God said, condemned. And God said, I will blot out man whom I have created, for I am sorry that I have made them. And God said, listen, and sank a boy in her like a stone. Tumor. On the scan, a monochrome nimbus of indiscernible material. My own, of course, but its intentions opaque. Its mouth, not a mouth, but a zero, a cipher, a space indicating a question it will not ask of itself. It requires me, like a child, to do another thing I'd rather not, to speak on its behalf, to determine its name so I might call it by it, so I might be accurate in my address, this precise knowing something like tenderness, my obsessive attention and ersatz love, and I cannot turn away from it unblinking oculus of my center, blank eye staring from benthic depths. And while I'm at it, it resembles too, I think, a fruit, if fruit were buried, a thonic pomegranate, a papayan fig for cocooned, or else the dark countenance of the moon, one of its seas, or the orphan planet of the dead, motherless stone, god of no and never. Angel. After a month of asking, suddenly a voice. It says, you deserve that which has happened to you. It says, I see what you do with your long tearn hands. Maundering through the banalities of my life, it follows, speaking, as if from a frosty bag of peas in the freezer aisle, speaking while I am on my knees, scrubbing the bathroom floor, trying to love a man. Its speech is disquieting company, but Company, nonetheless, the TV left on and turned low. It desperately wants my attention, but is polite, which is its defining weakness. Sometimes I catch it stirring out of the corner of my eye, a glint at the end of my cat's whiskers, a spangle on the ceiling of indiscernible source. More often, though, it looks like me, only a little off, like my reflection in the pregnant belly of a spoon. In fact, when I speak to it, I use my own name. I'm not sure if it minds. It repeats instead its refrain. It says, God has plans for you. It says, I didn't say they were good. And Hymen. Second blood, I never knew you. After the first, scoured the bed for your blazoned lot and came up empty. Perhaps I was born without you. A box with no prize inside, a Sunday with no cherry on top. God of good girls, God of matrimony, mother state, which I consider a distant country with a discordant tongue. Did you speak with God and conclude I hadn't use for you? Once I was small as your kin, so small and for such a long time, longer than I've lived, I fit inside my mother when she fit inside her mother, and so on and so forth, and further, a nest of matrons, knees and a beam, in which to be female is to be something like infinity, and was it determined then what kind of woman I would be? It seems I've always been frightened, little veil, of wedlock lock, clicking shut, the heritable procession of women whispering in the aisle, of my pulse, don't do, don't do, don't. And I haven't done this, the grave I'm in, the grave I've dug with the spade of pleasure. But wanting seal of want, I did want it, did choose to commit my life's greatest transgression with a benevolent accomplice. And so in the here before, you could say I am among the spared. 
What a mess. This messlessness of you could have been in any number of lives my size, billowing specters of dresses on a line of possibility, lives in which I am the bridesmaid and you, maidenhead, the bride given away where I am the acquired property and you the red ribbon severed in the threshold, I the purse and you the coin tendered. Perhaps no one ever told you, precious emblem of innocence, simulacrum for honor, that some believe you the most important part of me, vital, like a heart a man gets the thrill of bursting where he can see it, that blood is owed to him. And that's the heart of it, isn't it? Of a woman, you the only blood worth anything. Still life with hemorrhage. A wine crate for a nightstand and on it, a rose gone bad in a cup. It's water, a swallow of shadow, murk of rot and sugar. Clothes sloughed, bottleless and half eaten on a plate, a plum in its juice. At the center of the scene, a woman on a mattress on the floor. Her arms cast out as if preparing to fly or as if pinned, savior or specimen, still asleep, day breaking through the window, a warm leak, the woman in its spotlight, like a halo, as if something holy, or at least chosen. And I'm going to finish um, with the poem Exegesis. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. Um, Exegesis. I bled. God didn't want to hear about it. He said unclean and so it was. He said it is harm and so it was. Want to hear about it? He said unclean. Once a woman wanted, so he did her harm. And so it was first conceived. A woman suffering because a woman wanted. So he said cursed. And then he said blessed. The woman chose to suffer, conceived a God, though she never knew a man. And God knows best. If he calls a curse a blessing, then so it is. And he said she was clean. She never knew a man. I've known men, but never a God that bled and lived. But I did. Thanks. Thank you so much, Layla. That was gorgeous. Um, I, I love the line, the grave I've dug with the spade of pleasure. And somebody at home uh, commented on that exact line as well and said, it's, and, and said lovely indelible line, Layla, parentheses, not a question, I know, but we'll allow it. <laughs> we're getting a lot of, um, we're getting a lot of love from folks at home. We've got uh, folks, we've got exquisite with two exclamation points and more clapping and uh, a yay and a fantastic and a lovely um, and uh, for both Tracy and Layla's reading. And that's really nice to see. So thanks everybody for tuning in. I also, I don't know if folks at home can see or not, but after every, after every uh, poem, the other poets and I are like doing our silent round of applause, like up with our hands up here in the screen so that poets can see it. It's the new, it's the new mm, um, while people read is like this quiet little applause. Um, so thank you, thank you so much for that. That was glorious. Um, let's uh, let's head to our final reader. Uh, I am excited to introduce John Freeman. Uh, today, you're going to get a sneak peek of John's forthcoming collection, The Park. Uh, John Freeman's the editor of Freeman's, which is a literary biannual of new writing and executive editor over at Literary Hub. He's also the author of the poetry collection Maps, as well as multiple works of nonfiction. And he's coming to us uh, live right now from New York City, where I believe it's like thundering and hailing, maybe, but John is safe inside. So I will turn it over to John. Yay. Oh, thank you, Emily. Um, it's actually just stopped raining uh, and now the radiators are on. So if you hear someone hissing, it's not that they're booing my palms. It's just the radiator going off. Uh, yay. Loving, living in New York. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here um, with all of you, wherever you are, and also to read with um, Tracy and Layla, from, to hear you read from your remarkable books, that just tornadic pulmonary intensity of Tracy's poems and the sort of deep excavation that Layla is doing and spiritually um, and with her body 
in in that that debut book deluge it's just um i'm i feel really privileged to read with both of you um i also feel privileged to have the chance to write this book because um the park is really about living on the edge of Luxembourg Garden, um, where I spend part of the year as a professor at NYU in their low residency program. You can all get out your tiny violins and um, feel bad for me. Uh, but in the last couple of years, you know, um, things have been bad for a long time in the United States. But when I've been living there, uh, I just felt this real desire for some kind of tenderness and comfort because if you spend any time on the news or anywhere in, in public space or on the internet, you just see people being kind of awful to each other. And the most visible person in the world being horrific to people that are very vulnerable. So I, I found going into the park a great comfort and genuinely people in a park are nice to each other, but it doesn't clear away many of the issues we have in our life. Um, and one of them is just about how we've separated ourselves from nature. So the first poem I'll read is about that. It's called The Sacrifice. The Sacrifice. The difference between animals and us, the main one is, they don't need to know it's a park. The coyote lopes through just the same looking for food. We stop in mourning, sensing everything we've lost. We call that ceremony a park. I don't know how the other poets work or anyone listening. Um, I tend to just have these little satori moments where I'm walking down the street and a poem tackles me. And then I have to go home and write it down before my knees have stopped bleeding. Um, and so this next poem is one of those occurrences. It's called Modern Gods. Backlit by the glow from a small passageway he kneels into the fog of yellow light, head kissing the carpet. I step around him, respecting his privacy, when the mat becomes not prayer rug, but builder's tool, a black piece of tarmac laid down before the bank so he could peer close and fix the dead motion sensor so that people with money could be seen, all doors opening for them. Yeah, I was, I'm thinking a lot about spaces that people um, are in that are not just parks, but, you know, a, a bank is in some ways a park, but not everyone is invited to, you know, a house is a park, a nation's a park, a marriage is in some ways a park. Um, and we all live within these kind of curated spaces. And I'm, I'm just trying to think a little bit about what are the assumptions and presumptions of them. Um, Here's a poem kind of about that. It's called Seeing Things. Seeing Things. Now the trees rush, crackle in the dark. I sleep like a sailor on night watch. I was told, look in the shadows for figures that freeze. I can see straight through the park. There are the camps, there beds, there a man washing his foot in rainwater. You do not need to be a hawk to see here. No one talks of this, how winter doesn't just strip bare. It allows us to see what's always been there. One of the really bizarre things of being around the Luxembourg Gardens during this period is it obviously overlapped with the Syrian civil war and the huge um, ejection of many, many, many people from various nations in the Middle East into nearby refugee camps. Some people have walked as far as Europe. And in one winter afternoon, I was walking around the park and there were photographs of Syrian refugees in various states of, states of anguish. Uh, and then, Within the park, there were also refugees trying not to be seen in the morning. Um, and usually they were cleared out by, by police officers. And I, I just, I don't know what to do with that contradiction, or what kind of society that is. Uh, but other things happen. Um, and I think about this a lot now uh, in our moment because um, 
I don't know about you, wherever you are, but me, I suddenly hear a lot more birds. Uh, I, you, I'm not sure if you can see that this is my land of nod. That's my couch. There's my front window, which looks onto a street. And lately, these birds go flying up and down the street like Tom Cruise and Risky Business, like woo! And suddenly it just feels like the birds have, uh, have taken the city back. Um, and I don't want to celebrate that because it's, it's happening for a terrible reason. But the birds, um, it's like they, they have no conception of what's happening. And just as we've had no conception that we're also living, uh, living in their planet, so this is a poem called Birds. On the end, on the edge of the jar, night jars, fret shrikes pace the ground, that fierce kanjar between the eyes. This week, chiff chaff clocked in, flitting branch to branch on stocking legs, plumage pale as an emerald soaked in water. Whoever named them common suffers an ordinary mind. Wrens arrive to churring and scolding, singing about love. Somewhere a peregrine sits above it all in silence, targeting eyes ringed in yellow, Valkyrie of dominion. How often to pray one must be silent and alone. Whoever named a pistol grip a bird's head was looking at something without wonder, something dead. So um, like uh, Tracy, I tried to uh, not only write depressing poems, um, and sometimes the world intervened just by giving me one of those rare satori moments. So one day I walked out of the park and saw this. This is a poem called Charity. In the mouth of the church, two men, three women, picnic away from the rain, a man in rags beside them sleeping. Before they plate sandwiches, cornichons, fresh pears, cold meats, a piece of bread is broken from the loaf, wine poured into a red plastic cup, placed by his body, care taken not to waken him. It's really nice when you see all this evidence that people can be nice to each other. Uh, and maybe that is the norm instead of um, heckling and belittling or, or worse. Um, and I feel like a park is a beautiful place to see that. You see all kinds of things, people making out, people defecating, people pay, playing with their dogs, reading the newspaper, doing all sleeping. Um, and this next poem is sort of about how we all live within that cycle. Um, this is called The Waltz. Tonight in the park, I was reminded of the first waltz I attended dancers turning across the floor in orchestration, lights low, the beauty of being young and trying not to be in our dinner jackets and dresses, our parents' cars polished and parked outside, still ticking in the heat, unaware that this dance was a rehearsal. To what? It wasn't clear. The movement felt so free and so endless so much like the point around which the entire planet orbited. Just as tonight people stroll in twos in Paris, picnicking in groups, laughing with their tongues, lounging on chairs together, waiting for a chance dip in light like the lovers entwined by the empty kiosk, cooled by mists set off every 10 minutes on timers, a hiss of water meant for many. But now it's just them and the deep green shade of the trees, those chaperones of love's necessary disc discretion. Eventually it will be all of us turning and turning out of a final cool night. We hope together or in twos, but it might be alone. We need each other to face that fact, even on a night like this. And finally, um, I'll just read this last poem called The Folded Wing. Uh, it's, I've, I've been thinking about it because um, I had this, you know, crummy day when I was walking around all frowny and feeling bad for myself. And I walked by this uh, fountain um, and there was a duck with its wing stuck in, its beak stuck into its wing. And I just thought, yeah, 
Yeah. And I wrote this, uh, the folded wing. The lone duck in Medici fountain slips her beak beneath the wing and falls asleep, drifting like a hat tossed into a green pond. How good it feels to be one's own comfort, to discover all the warmth we need buried in our bodies. Yes, we bleed, we are broken, we get just one body. Yet there it lies most of the time, saying, rest here, lie down in me. I am more than less than you, even in a world that treats us as two. Thanks a lot. And thank you, Emily and uh, Elena and Laura and all the people at Copper Canyon for setting this up. Thank you so much, John. That was lovely. I, I was glad to hear you note uh, bird song because I have also had that feeling lately. Um, like, wow, I'm hearing birds everywhere and I, I'm having trouble sorting out whether I always hear birds everywhere and I haven't been as attentive to it. And maybe like this particular moment of isolation means that I am really hungry to hear from any kind of creature. And so my ears are, are perked for birds or if um, also birds are kind of returning to spaces uh, that mm -hmm. are empty of people. Um, and maybe I hope, maybe I hope it's both. Um, thank you for that reading. That was fantastic. We had a couple of people say, uh, no question, just want to say I'm enjoying this experience immensely. Thank you. Um, someone is very jealous of your awesome bookshelves, John. Um, <laughs> and somebody noted that your poems are a poignant record of our times. So I'm so glad. Oh, thank you very much. It's nice to hear from everybody at home. Thank you. Um, we're going to open things up to a Q&A right now. So folks who are watching, if you have a question for one or two or all three of our poets, feel free to write it into the Q&A feature that's at the bottom of your screen. Um, we do have a couple questions to kick us off. Um, and uh, one was inspired by John's comment uh, about this feeling of poems kind of hitting you as you're walking down the street, but I'd love to open up the question to everyone and see if it resonates with any of our poets. Um, this person asks, I'm wondering how that factors into your process. By that, I mean, do your poems come out mostly formed or still needing to be coaxed by revision to their final form? So I'd love to hear from, from any and all poets about how your poems arrive to you and in what form? Um, I'll say that it, it has always changed. Um, it used to be very physically painful um, because I realized the only way I could write was if, here, I'll do it right here on camera. I was like bent in this position and bent over writing on the floor <laughs> because, and I realized it's because I started writing in New York City where I didn't have a desk. I had a bed and like a little room to scoot around the bed and that's all the space I had. So I always wrote bent over and when I realized that like I had months in Madison Wisconsin to like try and write and nothing was coming out until one night I started writing on the floor I was like here it is here are the poems and I was like oh no I've made it this like very physically painful process and that's not sustainable um I also used to put through a lot more drafts I think than I do now sometimes um and I think it's because I that did make me start to hate my poems um and I just wanted to make sure that I still loved writing. So then I did a whole year of just writing on the backs of postcards and sending to friends um, just to take, to enjoy process of a product and just enjoy making and giving away. Um, and also because I knew that someday I did want to be a mom and my process used to be like very ritualistic and very long and, um, you know, two scented candles and 3 p.m. with like, this shade drawn and this one open. Just like weird stuff that like I thought helped. Um, but I knew that like, if I wanted to be a parent, um, I wouldn't get the luxury of time anymore. Um, and so my process just adapts as my life changes. Um, and they don't arrive the same way um, all the time. And now I owe all of my poems to the fact that people will meet with me and ask to see a poem. So my writing group is like my deadline. Um, otherwise I would just play Legos <laughs> and garden. <laughs> and like, I just wouldn't make time for myself in that way um, if I didn't have people who would like sit down and talk with me about it um, once a month. And that's, that's what's working right now is like people saying like, hey, let's talk about what you're up to. Um, and that's what helps me right now is to show up to a group of people who care. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess like for me, for a long time, I was so used to having 
um, like I, I, I had a lot of time. Um, I was blessed with a lot of time for a number of years. And, and so for me, my process involved anytime I had the idea for a poem, I work in the morning um, on writing and I would sit with it until it was done. Um, I couldn't really return. It was very difficult for me to come back in if I had abandoned it or if I'd put on an ending that wasn't right. And so I would sit there, I think probably on average about three hours, like until the poem was finished and then I could walk away. Um, and sometimes it'd be very difficult because um, the longest the poem ever took me was, was I think, from Hyman, um, because that was a 12-hour stretch that really felt like a marathon. And I knew that if I walked away, I wouldn't be able to re-enter the poem. And so I literally was like on my floor with like, you know, pounding beverages and like, you know, just like trying to endure this real, and you know, you said it was physical, Tracy. And like, for me, it was very physical and very painful. And it was, I was exhausted by the end of it. I, you know, I think it was like past midnight and I'd been working it all day. Um, and so that poem, uh, and that process, uh, some of my like favorite poems is through this kind of like agonizing line by line and I re revise as I work down the page. Um, but once I reach the ending, I don't go back. So it's sort of like whatever ends up when I get to that final period or whatever is the final punctuation mark, then the poem is done and either it's a version that I accept or I write another poem a different day that's not that poem. Um, but I have been recently because I don't have as much time these days. I've started doing something that I call night poems, um, which is that just to make sure I'm writing, um, I write poems on my, on my phone at night um, because it's something that I know I'll have that time at the end of the day. Um, it's, it gets me out of my own way because I'm half asleep and I know I need to finish this before I go to bed. So it kind of pushes me to, to finish it up so I can go to bed. Um, but I do end up writing then every night. Um, and the poems are a little more fluid, a little less, controlled um, and a little stranger and surreal because of that, because it's in this kind of half awake, half asleep phase. And the fact that it's on my phone, I think also frees me up to feel less precious. Um, and so those poems are different than the poems I, I wrote for Deluge, but um, it keeps me writing. And I think that, that I, I think I'm quite young still in my process, but I, I feel like the way I approach writing will change over my career. And I think that right now I'm in this other stage that's in this sort of more play and, you know, I don't know, fragmented sort of way of thinking about, about a poem. It's really cool to hear both of you speak about what you do, because I, I really admire, Tracy, your associative logic. It, it accumulates so much momentum. It, it, it's, it's like one of those um, roller coaster rides where your head is whipping around and you're, <laughs> And to hear that it's made is kind of exciting. And similarly, the, um, the sort of poise and naturalness of your um, thought patterns in um, Deluge, Layla, is, feels so uh, straightforward to, to hear that it's sort of made carefully, makes sense, but it, while you're reading it, it doesn't feel at all brittle. Um, I guess with, with my poems, um, there, I really, I take a lot of photographs and I, I really want there to be an image in the poem that that sort of jumps out at, at you as because I, I don't know, I look around a lot and I see things and I what's going on there, you know, and I, I kind of want that experience to be in a poem, but I don't want the poem to be entirely one image based. And so for a short poem like the one, last one I read, I, I did go back to my room and write that in one sitting. I don't know how long it took, but I, I knew that everything was, could be unspooled from that one image of the, of the bird in the pond. Whereas other poems take longer and, it, and it's just simply because they might move in time frame or they might um, change, you know, uh, register of speech or something. And those poems to me are harder to write and take longer and I have to kind of pick them up and put them down. Thank you. I wonder if there's some future in like a poet yoga series that consists of like all of the strange <laughs> contorted physical positions. I think most of them are like this, you know. You don't feel <laughs> position being one of them, of course. Um, thank you. That was that was great to hear from all of you on that. We've got a question from a creative writing student who's currently taking a, a writing class and um, they are curious 
um, any and all of you, if you have a particular place or person or thing that you go to when you need to find inspiration. And I love this question because now when our worlds have shrunk in some ways, I wonder especially where you all are going um, for your inspiration font when maybe you're not leaving the house all that much and having to kind of find your way to inspiration in, in new ways. So I'd love to hear anyone talk about that a little bit. Um, so one thing that has been working, just to speak to the moment, um, and as the way to like keep me writing, I will say like the, the hardest points in my life, like w in really deep grief, crawling to the shower level of non-function, um, I wish I'd, I always wish I'd written more, but it's so hard in the midst of like darker times or grief to write or feel like you can make something that has a shape. Um, and so I think list poems and anaphora have like, been some of the most useful. Um, like right now I'm writing with uh, the word today a lot. Um, today, 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 because it is just very um, the moment. Um, and I think the other source of inspiration, which is so corny, is just my son. Um, is he says something like um, when he was littler, he was just like looking inside the oven and he's like, mom, turn on the light so I can see all the nothing. Um, <laughs> and like, uh the other day he's like mom you need more practice uh not being in a hurry when there's no reason to hurry and he, he'll just say things all the time and right now he wants to build a museum of fire so of course a poem is forthcoming called museum of fire um so lots of times just like being with this like little creative person um who doesn't know what a cliche is yet it's just like is really generative for me he's um He's the source of a lot of stuff for me. Um, but I wanna you know, be sure as he gets older to be really careful about that line of you know, like sharing too much of his life or putting things out there he would be upset with me for later. Um, but um, so anaphora and lists for times of where it's hard to get things out in my opinion is like a, a way that something that helps me. Um, and then just one of the most inspiring people in my life is just my kid. I love that, I love that a lot. <laughs> me too. Um, I think for me, in terms of inspiration, I think that's a great question. And I hear it a lot. And I'm always sort of trying to tap into my own, like, it's a good reminder to myself to think about what inspires me and what, um, you know, what I should be paying attention to, I think. And more than what I look toward, I think, is what I'm not looking at. So I, I think for me to be inspired, I need to turn off certain things um, and let something come to me. So for me, that's trying not to check the news or social media um, during my writing time. So mine is in the morning. Um, if I do that, then it's not, my brain is not in a creative space. And so I can't be inspired. I think there could be like amazing things happening around me and I wouldn't be able to write about them. Um, so, so kind of creating a, a silence around myself to, to be um, maybe hypersensitive. My senses kind of pick up um, and I'm, I'm more in touch with my own thoughts and feelings um, when there's quiet. Um, but I also keep a notebook. Um, and I keep, I keep many notebooks, but I have one that's sort of life, life things. And then I have a notebook that's specifically for when I'm reading. And so I write down lines that I like. I write down, I mean, I write down whole poems sometimes, but I also write down words. And sometimes I have lists of words that I just like, um, so that I can sometimes, if I want to, just like divine, like put my finger over the page and pick out like five words and run with it. Um, and I write down like strange facts. Like when I'm reading, I'm, I'm one of those people who like falls into deep Wikipedia holes and like will be fascinated by, you know, did you know this weird fact about the color pink or something or that they, you know, trained bats to try and like drop bombs during World War II. Like, they, like weird things where you're like, wow, what, why? And so I just like constantly am just keeping notes and, and then I flip through these journals um, when I'm just sitting around and there's almost always something that will shout out at me that was originally interesting and then like connects with whatever I'm wherever I'm at now in time and somehow that combination can be a poem even if it wasn't originally a poem um so yeah just like keeping track of things I find interesting and following that interest um I think there's so many strange and delightful things um and I do play the game I spend a lot of time alone so this um isolation is not un unfortunately too unfamiliar for me um but even just like looking at something like challenging myself to look at 
I don't know, out the window or at a chair or something in the, the room for like five to 10 minutes and then like really looking at it and trying to think of all the ways I might describe it um, and sort of going through a game of like, all right, the first one is obvious, something site-based, but um, what if I say that this looks like this? And then if I say this looks like this, and this also looks like this, and kind of going down um, the furthest away from my first impression of something, and that can be a fun game. Oh, and form. Form's really been inspirational for me because it sort of forces me to, to move through the poem. So form has been a big thing for me. My, uh, my computer crashed while Layla was speaking. So oh, no. <laughs> one of my uh, inspirations, actually I've now moved over to where I sit normally, which is at the kitchen island, but I can show you my dog a day calendar. Ooh. Um, it's from, uh, it's dog shaming. Um, and today's dogs said, one of them sitting next to the other says, I peed on the air freshener. And then the other one said, then I peed on his pee. <laughs> and uh, I, I I, that sounds stupid, but I, I like to be around as many things that remind me that humans aren't the center of the universe. Um, because one of the things I, I feel like would be a challenge for the future is to write a non-human centric text. And Richard Powers did that with The Overstory and C.D. Wright did that with her amazing book about um, beech trees. And I'm, I, I don't think I'm capable of doing that, but I want to try to at least think in, that, in those terms. And even if it's a stupid calendar, it does that. But for me, poets are endlessly in inspiring. And this isn't my poetry shelf, but it's the overflow. This is, um, uh, it's one of these shelf risers. So I think this is the R. So you see a lot of Adrian Rich, Thomas, Do um, what's his name? Albert, Thomas Rosrich, Alberto Rios, K Ryan, big, big, big K Ryan fan. Um, she's fucking awesome. Sorry. Um, she just does these things with poems where it's like a little tiny, bullet but inside it's a universe where happy things happen um natalie diaz is on that shelf because she's uh so often given away uh and i don't know i just when i when i come in in the morning there's a table next to that i usually grab just a random book of poems and um sit down and then at some point every poet does something interesting in their own way and that makes me want to write not so much out of imitation but just out of sheer happiness uh, with, with what language can do. And then, then I'm off. Um, and it comes out sometimes sounding like me trying to sound like them, but usually it's just something else. Thank you. Um, I, Tracy, I look forward to your son's first book of poetry. Um, I hope Copper Canyon Press has first dibs. Um, thank you all. Uh, I love the John, I love the tour of your of your shelves. I think everybody at home is probably jealous of your your bookshelves. Um, and and Layla, I am also an obsessive like word writer downer, and I have a note in my phone that doesn't have anything else in it except for the word Zugzwang. So that's my that's my contribution to, <laughs> to this. I can't even remember what it means, but I'm gonna after this I'm gonna go and look up Zugzwang to try to figure out why I wrote that word down. Um, hopefully it's a real word and I didn't, those aren't just sounds I made up. Um, so we, we are almost right at time, but there's a question that is too good for me to not ask. And so this will be our final question. Um, and, uh, you know, any, again, anybody can answer. Um, I find this question fascinating because I'm a person who's, who uh, dreams really vividly and has been like dream journaling since I was like a wee little kid. Um, so this person asks, are any of the poets dreaming in, in these times? Anything weird or interesting you'd feel comfortable sharing? And I love this question because I, for me anyway, there is a little bit of overlap. It's a Venn diagram between like the unconscious mind and dreaming a little bit and inspiration. So um, I throw this out to anybody for a quick response as we wrap up here. Anybody dreaming? I have no dreams. <laughs> dreams are all gone. No, I don't know. I think I've been sleeping very solidly. Um, I would be, I would welcome some dreams. Oh, good for you. Good sleep is good now. <laughs> I've been sleeping like eight hours, uh, very solidly, but um, the day it doesn't tend to be as restful. And um, I had coronavirus. I had it for a while and then I got over it. And, I'm 99% sure that I'm not contagious. So a friend and I walking seven feet apart have been going for walks late at night. And this is a way around your question, but we've been walking at 
New York City at night, which has um, really changed a lot. And it's like a kind of waking dream slash nightmare because the streets are absolutely empty. And even more so than before, the only people who are on the streets um, have nowhere else to go. And the police aren't on foot, um, they're in their cars. And so it's, it's actually quite um, terrifying actually that, because people um, are really disturbed um, and there's no one you know, coming up and saying, do you want some food or you can come into this van, we'll take you to a shelter or we'll take you in. And uh, it just feels kind of as out of control as the numbers that you see about coronavirus deaths are. It feels that out of control at night on the street. Um, and I'm not saying I'm, a, I'm afraid by nature of people without shelter. It's just the streets themselves feel um, like they've changed and, and the people left really have nowhere to go. And that to me feels like a, a kind of bad dream that we're living through. Yeah, that's a good point. So much of what's happening right now can feel sort of surreal in a lot of ways. Um, Tracy, any dream thoughts? The last dream I vividly remember, my son was eaten by an alligator, so it was not great. Um, but um, I will say like my dreams often tend around water. Um, and for whatever reason, rivers are uh, fear dreams for me. Um, rivers are always, there's tons of alligators and crocodiles, like a lot of river dreams feature that for me. Um, but the, the happiest dreams are actually when I am in dark water, um, and dark water is a place where I'm not afraid. Um, like there's often sharks, there's often monsters, um, but I'm very peaceful there and at home there. Um, and I know that uh, one lot, I don't think my, my um, I think only one time have I dreamed something that then showed up in a poem and it was diving for whale bones to bring them back up to a boat. Um, but I, I think that is about wanting to look at the things that seem scary um, and hoping that at least in, if I can't do that in my waking life or in the poem, that in my dream life, I'm able to get to something, um, dare I say real, um, but something that needs a resurrection, um, something that needs a little uh, light shown on it. And I guess if I, some things I'd rather not remember, like my son being eaten by an alligator. <laughs> um, but maybe there's some, you know, some important psychological work being done in the middle of all that water. Thank you, everyone, for indulging this interesting dream question. Um, we're, we're at about time, so I want to just show your beautiful children one more time. Uh, this is Tracy's Come the Slumberless to the Land of Nod, which you can see behind her right now. This is Layla's gorgeous book, Deluge. And this is John's incredible new book, the park. So um, thank you to all of our poets so much for joining us today. And thank you to everybody out there at home for coming together across time zones and geography in the name of poetry. Uh, that's so meaningful right now. We are hoping that you all stay well and safe out there. We are grateful for you. Um, we're going to be back next week, uh, next Thursday, April 16th. We have another live stream featuring Ed Skoog, Victoria Chang, and Philip Metro. So uh, come back next week. Um, and thank you all so much. Take care. We'll see ya. Thanks, Emily.